Hello, I'm Joel Baird, the General Manager of Missoula Community Access Television, inviting you to another edition of What's Up Missoula. Today in the studio with me is Donna McRae, who is the Head of Archives and Special Collections at the University of Montana Mansfield Library. Donna, thanks so much for coming on the show. Thank you for the invitation. I oh, really appreciate welcome. it. You're welcome. As, as I was telling you before we started recording, I've been meaning to introduce the collection to the general population for a really long time. And um, I think what people in the audience, the television audience, should know is that the Mansfield Library at University of Montana is open to everyone. It's part of the town and gown arrangement um, so that if you've never attended University of Montana, if you're a high school student, for instance, even middle schooler, you could go to the Mansfield Library and you could also look at um, the special collections and archives there and I had a thought, oh, if you were an alum of the University of Montana and you pay your annual dues, you also have borrowing privileges. I got all that right. Yes, extra borrowing privileges. Extra yes, borrowing but, privileges. But if you are a resident of Montana, you do have borrowing privileges for oh, most I of our materials. Know that. Yeah, right. I'm not going to pay anymore. No, I still will. <laughs> well, okay, so the first question is um, you know, a lot of people, the archive comes to their mind. And I don't know whether they think it's like an old word, it's a Latin word or something. Um, you know, I always think of catacombs and mm, archives yeah. or something. But I think people think, well, it's really old, old, old. I'm not sure. But um, what is the function of the archive and special collection there? Why do you think they even made it? First? Right. So um, we have been in existence as an official archive of the University of Montana since 1968. But we had a treasure room, it was called, even before oh, that. Wow, so, yeah. so the library has been collecting things like historic documents and photographs probably, you know, since pretty much the university began. We yeah. have, you know, the original commencement address and the original annual reports that were created. So we have records all the way back to the founding of the university. Yeah. And it's a strange impulse. Everyone can understand it, you know, that we want our lives documented. I don't, I'm not exactly sure why, but every occasion, right, is right. graduation time, the birth, um, even funeral get-togethers, mm -hmm. people are snapping those photos. You right. know, that there's some impulse in us. Maybe it goes all the way from the cave drawings. I don't know. And then, of course, the older things become, the more important they seem to, mm -hmm. to, to be. And it seems like in this level of detail, too, really occurs to us in Missoula because the town's so small. Right. It's so relatively young, yet if I say, well, I think it was incorporated in 1883 or whatever, it seems a really long time ago. But if you think of European towns, you know, mm -hmm. where they've been, oh, we've been here for 1,500 right. years or right. whatever. Um, so if people want to, to look at things that are in the archive, um, what do they do? Uh, you know, does the public feel like, well, I can't go in there without white gloves yeah. on her? No, we, um, we are trying very hard to let people know that we are open, accessible to um, the general public as well as to people who come to do scholarship, you know, their students at the university or their faculty at the university. Or we have um, people who come from other institutions and even overseas to do research in the archives. But it's very much open and that's what today is about, open to the people in Missoula and we yeah. want them to come in and use the materials. So our focus of what we have is on um, the documenting the people, events, and activities of the University of Montana, so the students and what they're doing, the faculty and what they're doing, um, but also on the larger community and, and what we really consider to be the Five Valleys area. Um, we have photographs, unpublished materials like diaries and letters. Um, we have the records of organizations like the Farmer's Market in Missoula and its yeah. founding documents, but also the Missoula Mercantile, which was you know here at the turn of the, at, at the, turn of the 19th right. century, century and into the early 20th century. Um, so kind of a broad range of documentation. And then we also have records of um, people who have been representatives and senators, Congress people from Montana in general, and, and Mike Mansfield and his papers are a classic example oh, of what sure. we have. Yeah. Jeanette Rankin is another famous figure mm -hmm. that people often think yeah. of yeah. when they think of the illustrious involvement of Montana in the federal government, yeah. you know, yeah. which is, it's, it's far. Yeah, I actually got a letter um, from Jeanette Rankin oh, that I thought wonderful. you might be interested in. This is a letter, or just a quick note that she wrote um, to Mike Mansfield, and this came out of Mike Mansfield's collection. Oh, I see. Um, so I'm going to hold it up for it. Philip's yeah. in the studio. 
So he can zoom in yeah. and show people at home some things. But she went to see Mansfield in his office and wrote him a letter. Um, there it is. So I just I love that because it's a combination of my, of Mike Mansfield and Jeanette Rankin. Right, and they are two luminaries, mm -hmm. you know, in, in, in Montana federal history. Anyway, and of course the shirt I'm wearing isn't helping greatly. <laughs> but so now here, that's really interesting. You know, she writes uh, faithfully. And then in red, I assume this was someone else that wrote Rankin. Right. Here's Jeanette, you know, she signed it. And then somebody's going to clarify, well, this is Jeanette Rankin. Right. So this is his office, you yeah. know, who, who gets letters from around the world. Sure. Documenting who they are and filing it in a little file folder for Jeanette Rankin's materials. Yeah. So somebody wrote, oh, Rankin on that. Yeah. Should we show them the cover of the Missoula Mercantile? Oh, one? yeah. So what I wanted to say is that we have, as I was saying, um, lots of people who come in and use our collections. And so uh, an example of recent use of the collections that we have are um, the records of the Missoula Mercantile. Um, and Miney Smith, as you can see, and I'm sure you know, wrote a book about the Missoula yes. Mercantile. And so our photographs are in there. She did research in the papers of the two um, presidents, C.H. McLeod and, and Walter McLeod. So um, that documentation is included in the book. We have that McLeod Avenue in the university right, district. Right, right. Here's another one. Um, this is by a scholar who's um, who's not at the University of Montana, but he wrote a book recently about uh, Guy M. Brandborg, who was part of the Forest Service um, and, uh, and was active in the fight against clear-cutting after he was no longer Forest Service supervisor for the Bitterroot National Forest. Um, and so Fred Swanson came up and used Brandborg's papers that we have in the oh, archives as great. part of um, and to inform this book that he wrote. So yeah. it's another example of how our materials get used. And then I can remember just so vaguely, you know, they're from high school or college, where we were doing our little kid research papers and mm -hmm. we talk about primary sources. Yes. And I think the very dis you know, important distinction of primary, secondary, tertiary yeah. sources, like how close to the person or topics you're discussing, how close can you get? And a lot of people know that they say, oh, that's, that's a secondhand story. Yeah. Yeah. So even in the vernacular, people make a distinction like, what's really close to the issue? And an archive can serve that purpose too, right? Yeah. Where people are looking at the way things work. And I think that's a great segue for uh, that pamphlet. Oh, right. Is, so this, uh, this is such a great um, primary source document. But it's a classic example. Um, this pamphlet, which is entitled, you know, it's probably got 20 pages, entitled Uncle Sam Will Give You a Home in the Flathead Indian Reservation, um, published in 1907 by the Northern Pacific Railway, which was keenly interested in bringing people out from the Midwest and the East yes. to buy land on what was the Indian Reservation, which had been open um, to allotment. And so this is, again, a primary source, 1907, absolute documentation of the time period and what was happening at the time. Yeah, and it shows, you know, like, this does seem so surreal mm -hmm. right now that you mm -hmm. imagine, like, a whole people were um, moved and, and herded like cattle, and then the very land that they were put on where they were supposed to be safe Uncle Sam is inviting right. more uh, Europeans to find a home yes, there. Yes, yes. So and um, Philip Mackling's been on the show you know, now and again, who was the historic preservation officer for the city. And he'd often talk about how the library, uh, how the, the railroad would lie to the people mm -hmm. and tell them there were all these amenities oh, in towns that didn't exist at all that have these yeah, doctored yeah. postcards <laughs> showing um, clean sidewalks and oh, yeah. cheerful children when they were actually playing in the mud in some surly fashion. Here's another example from our collection, and this I brought just because I wanted to talk about the conservation work that we're doing on our collections. But this title, as you can see, is called the Fertile Flathead Valley. Again, Great Northern Railway. Um, and it is all about how much water there is in the, in the Bitterroot. Oh, and, um, and, and this one's specifically for the Flathead. But they, we have these pamphlets for the, the Bitterroot Valley as well, getting people to come out, buy orchards, settle the land. And it's um, just fascinating. Oh, if you guys could go back to it one more time, to that picture. Because I want to point out the other thing about this primary source is the modesty of that, um, you know, late Victorian dress. You know, right. imagine that you're going to get a, a young woman in her mid-twenties to go out picking cherries right. in the middle of the summer in a, a dress that, like, draggled along the ground and then wearing maybe a corset. Yeah and all kinds of restraints and then have a, um, you know, a, a blouse of that 
uh, amount of cloth. So right, right. It's, it's just pretty a, a genteel occupation, right. like going out to pick your apples in the orchard. Since we're on the, the topic of primary sources, I want to show just a couple more if I could. Um, this is a picture of, um, well, let's dig through here and find it. Teepees in the area that, oh, that might be a little bit shiny. I don't know if that's going to work. Teepees in the area that is um, now where the University of Montana is pretty much right there. Um, and I think you've probably picture seen picture this picture before. Yeah. Um, our images from the archives are, well, they're in the Peak Athletic Building next door, and they're in the yes, Montana Club that. and the Oxford, and so, uh, as well as hanging in people's homes. And um, this is one that's been used a couple that's of times. That's really remarkable, though. Yeah. Circa 1890, photographer mm -hmm. unknown. Yeah. Yes, the Peak Athletic Club right next to MCAT here mm -hmm. has a large picture of what that building used to house. The Caterpillar yeah. Company yeah. had um, tractors, and I couldn't make out half of the, the things. And then, of course, I looked here to the old Mazulian building where mm -hmm. MCAT studios are, and there was like a name like Mercer mm. over, like I could see it. It was looking out the window of that building to the west, and instead of saying Mazulian, as I thought it might, it said Mercer. Mm -hmm. But the Missoulian so, building that was here was relatively small, and there's another picture I saw in the archive online, mm -hmm. which I guess we should mention, oh, because we didn't do, yeah. yet show people um, the website for the archive, yeah. if you guys could put that up. So we have about probably 100,000 images in our whole collection, and oh, we've man. digitized and put up about 6,000 of them so far, and we continue so to digitize So much work. Them. That's wonderful. Yeah. Do you have, like, work-study students do it? Um, <laughs> actually, we have a mix. So we do have a photo archivist, and he yeah. does select the materials and do the scanning and put them online, and that's a lot of his work as the reference. When you call and ask for a photo of a particular area, he's yeah. helping you find that, and he's identifying images to put online. It is a lot of work. You know, here yeah. at MCAT's been going since 1990, so that's 23 years of video recording, mm -hmm. which are in drawers in the right. other room. And those uh, tapes, originally, somebody said, well, those tapes are going to go bad. You know, you've got to mix them onto DVD. So we did all that, mm -hmm. the entire collection onto DVD. And somebody said, oh, those DVDs are going bad. Yeah. You really need to just digitize yeah. them. And we've been trying, yeah. but it's slow going. We, oh, here's a picture they have of Arbor Day. Yeah. So we've got, right, so we have online exhibits. Um, we have a, a really nice exhibit right now up of the um, College for, of Forestry and Conservation celebrating their 100-year anniversary, oh, so their the centennial, and so edition, there's an like exhibit. You'll, you'll, you'll say, pay attention to this, because with, with so many images, you need to focus them yeah. for the public. Well, so, right, so we have the general collection of images that you can look at, um, the 6,000, and just browse through and put a keyword in, or we have these specific exhibits that we put up around themes, like Mike Mansfield or College yeah. of Forestry or Campus Planning. That's the homepage of our, of yeah. our photo collection. They've been kind of going through it. I yeah. saw like a bicycle, that yeah. red one that was um, yeah. advertising the man's ability to right. sell and maintain bicycles. Right. So Should we let Philip go? I don't know. Do you want to show more pictures with him? Oh, yeah. Can I just show a couple more things here? Well, that was so, very nice. Thanks for showing the internet. Yeah. Let's, and then people can just Google Mansfield Library Archive to get there. Yes. For one thing. Because I know we can say the string specifically, but who's going to, you know, I can see them at home. <laughs> Wait, I need to write that down. I wanted to mention a couple things. Um, we get donations all the time and, oh, and right. really like to get donations. And one of the most recent things that we've gotten is this um, diary. Uh, written by uh, Japanese, it's in Japanese, um, and I'll that show amazing? that to you. This is open. You could just zoom yep. in on the where too. This is to see the condition of the outside. I don't know if this is leather or paper. I think you know, it's paper, yeah. The, but the, the certainly, it's it's app. age. This is from 1907, or it starts in 1907, runs to about wow. 1912. Um, really well. This is Henry Katsuji Hashitani, and um, his granddaughter lives here in Missoula. This. Uh, is all in Japanese, so we don't really know what it says, but a portion of it was translated at one point um, several years ago, and so we know that the very first part of this diary, starting in 1907, documents um, Mr. Hashitani's time working for the railroads in the Missoula area and up on Evero Hill. So oh, wow. I really want this to get yeah. translated so that we can get this primary source, first-person right. account from a Japanese person about his experiences working for the railroad, working on farms. He later went on to Oregon and became a businessman. But yeah, so we're getting these 
collections all the time. And, and our scope and our area of interest, as I mentioned earlier, is Missoula. So this does cross over And the Five Missoula. Valleys, which yeah. includes the Everett yeah. Hill. And, the, you know, of course, railroad people are just wild about railroad <laughs> right. history, aren't they? They say, oh, he's one of those railroad buffs. And, you know, okay, look out. But um, this looks really fascinating. Yeah. So it needs some conservation work, of course. And, and it also needs some translation work, I think, if anybody's going to be able to see it. And then if I could just show one more. Um, we were talking about us documenting the history of the University of Montana. And one of the ways that we do that is through the newsletters and flyers and publications of right. various campus offices. So this is a um, newsletter written by the Black Studies group. Um, and then here's a flyer or sort of a yeah, pamphlet that really they put great. out. Um, we're coming up on the 45th anniversary of the University of Montana's Black Studies program. Begun in so, 1968. 1968, yeah. We were one of the earliest in the nation. and. So this is a, an example of, of a publication that they put out in the early 1970s encouraging students from around the country, not just Montana, of course, from around the country to come to Missoula, to the University of Montana. And join and be a the part Black of, Studies and, right. program, which, you know, everyone thought, well, that is the most amazing thing. And I'm just going to read a teeny bit. Um, it says, in the fall of 1973, so this, I guess, was slightly after that, there were approximately 50 black students on the University of Montana campus who were recruited specifically under the Black Studies program. And that students have come from California, Washington, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, et cetera. Yeah. So that is amazing. And then there are student comments, the so students that had come and really liked the program. Yeah. But that is really So something. a little snapshot of the university's history and, yeah. and an example of what we collect. And I would love to hear from members of your audience if they have documents from their time as students at the university. I just, in the mail, um, last week uh, got another um, a donation from a woman who's now living in Florida. But she sent, you know, here's her little student card wow. from the 1930s and, oh and got a the dance card, card, right? Oh, a student rate card. Um, and it's got the Wilma Theater specifically listed on it, as though she were an employee or something. But it's saying, it's proving to Wilma Theater that the bearer is really yeah, a student. student. And I think it's very sophisticated that it's a photo ID Yeah. back in yeah. the 30s. So I, I love that. And here's a couple dance cards that she had in her collection that she sent us. So, you know, oh we're goodness. always interested. This is a scary one. <laughs> it's really clever, too. There's like a, a ghost enveloping a house. So this might have been a Halloween. Yeah, it's a haunted house party. Alpha Tau Omega. Omega. Yeah. yeah. And I can't read it. It says February 20 yeah. something. Annual haunted house. Yeah, annual haunted house party, 1938. Goodness, they yeah. waited quite a bit to the dinner winter <laughs> February for the <laughs> Halloween. But that's amazing too that she kept such good care yeah. of that. And the, and I'm so grateful that she sent it to us because it's a really good documentation of what students were experiencing. Yeah. And w when the archive, you know, if you have object art like that, mm -hmm. then do you have a time or place where you can make that available to the public around the themes, as you mentioned? Yeah, we could certainly do that. We're, you know, if you wanted to come in and just see anything that we have related to dance cards, we could pull things out right. like that for you just in general. But we do put up exhibits. Um, there's a really good exhibit up right now celebrating the history of the of the College of Forestry and Conservation, and it includes a lot of Forester's Ball oh, dance sure. cards and, and the tickets and things like that. So those are out and, able, and available for people to see. Oh, well, that's nice. So, so people can go... Um, can you tell them where you're located within the library? Because yes. I know there's like mm -hmm. four rather large floors. Yeah, there. so you come in on the main floor, which is actually called Level 3, and if you go up one floor, then archives and special collections in the Montana collection are all sort of in the back corner there. So Montana collection has a lot of interesting things mm -hmm. to see about yeah. Montana. There is an elevator. Mm -hmm. There is. Too. And yeah. that's, I don't mean to be ages, but sometimes, you know, older oh, people yeah. are, you know, they have the time to, to reminisce and want to see yeah. things. And I think it's good to say, well, if it's on, a, on level four, yeah. no, you one, you know, there's only one level up right. and there's right. an elevator. And we're open nine to five Monday through Friday. Okay. During the academic year, we stay open until seven o'clock on Wednesdays. And then we can come in by appointment, if those hours don't yeah. work for people, they can contact And it's a good them. idea, too, if people um, wanted to go to have a specific thing, do you think? Or well, you, I mean, if somebody have. came and said, I want to see what you got here. Yeah, um, you could come in and, and look at our guides to collections and, and say, mm -hmm. you know, you look at a guide and you say, oh, this is really interesting to me. Will you pull it out for me? And yeah. Sure, we can do that. We have a whole room of 
regional and historic maps. We have about seven or 8,000 historic maps that you can just come and browse through. Yeah, and so you don't need well. to you know, know in advance. There's city directories where you could come and look. For example, you could look at the address here and find out oh, all the various here, businesses like in the that are here. Or yeah. Something like yeah, that. and that's just open and available on the shelves when you come in. Yeah. So. I always thought it would be really fun you know, to use MCAT, but I've never figured out how to do this to use MCAT as a kind of fulcrum for people mm. discussing the way town was. Yeah. And I, I, often I got worried, though, that it would lead to um, people saying this or that personal thing. Mm -hmm. And so as we're, I don't know if yeah. you have that problem within the collections, but sometimes and it, it comes up perhaps in oral histories mm -hmm. that you're trying to guard the privacy of this or that one. Yeah. So you don't really want someone to say, oh, and that's when she had that illegal abortion right. in 51. You know, and you're right. like, oh, darn it. You know? We do. It's interesting that you mention that because we do have a really great collection of oral histories, which is around illegal abortion in Montana. Oh my gosh! And yeah. so you can come and, and hear the stories of what it was like when abortion was illegal. Now, some of those women made a condition that they, you know, they wanted their story to be known, but they didn't want it to be known while they were living. Yeah. So they gave the material to the archives or did the recording with the understanding that that recording would not be released until they passed yeah. away. And we're okay with that. So we'd rather have the real story and have it documented and put a restriction on it for a period of time oh, than sure. not get it at all. Yeah. Because it's and certainly part of our history. It's a very sensitive mm -hmm. area, too, yeah. you know, where people are revealing things and it becomes a lesson for, for subsequent generations, mm -hmm. you know, someone's life experience. Yeah. But at the same time, they do have all that, that fear that there'll be repercussions. And right. So there's a strong emotional yeah. element to mm -hmm. it as well. And I think businesses know that the past has power. Mm -hmm. I mean, just as we do see, sometimes you'll see ads where they've obviously accessed your collection to show downtown Missoula in right. the day and make a point right. about something, reliability. And some businesses have just been here forever, mm -hmm. like Missoula Textiles across right. the street inside there. And, and I think in the West in particular, that sense of, history and continuity is more rare you know, because it's so young. Yeah. There's not many antiques here compared to, say, the eastern seaboard or what have right. you, right? Right. It's, yeah, relative, I guess, but yeah, yeah absolutely. That, that I think people hold it in regard, like, to be able to say, like, my house was built in 1911. And I think, oh, that's pretty yeah. good, yeah. you know? It's just an old little railroad right. house. Um, we might have the architectural drawings for it. Yeah, in for instance. Archives, yeah. It was called a folk pyramidal or yeah. something like this. But um, history is a rare thing around here in the West, you know, because well, it's so young. Yeah, it depends. On, I mean, I think of history being something that happened, like, you know, the, in the 1970s with yeah, the Black Studies really program or something too. that happened, you know, well, 10 years ago. Well, and you just have to ago, talk so. to young people yeah. and <laughs> right, say, oh, yeah, that was about 15 years ago. Yeah. They're like, oh, my God, yeah. the eyes get really big. Like, oh, that was forever. <laughs> they enjoy making me feel old. <laughs> well, is there anything you want to add? Well, I guess I would just, um, again, let people know that we are open to the public. The uh, other thing that I'd want to mention about the Mansfield Library in general, you already said that we're open, the whole library is open to the public. We have access to some amazing databases, not in archives and special collections specifically, but if you come into the library, you can get the New York Times Historical. You can get, we are a full federal depository, so you can get pretty much everything that the federal government has ever published for free. Yeah. So um, I think we have a lot of really great resources that may not be um, fully recognized by the rest right, of the community. Right, because if people say, I'm not a scholar, yeah. and yet they may have a hobby, yeah. they may have an interest, or something, you know, really takes hold of them um, about federal law or, or something, yeah. you know, where they're not aware that there's this resource. They think, oh, that's just for university faculty and students, mm -hmm. it's not for me, right. which isn't the case. Right. And in the evening, the parking isn't terrible. Well, now in, now in the summer, it's not terrible either. now in the summer, it's not terrible either. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, Oh, I did want to emphasize for people watching that you're still adding to collections. We so are. if people are out there and they see the program, mm -hmm. they might think, you know, you can always just yeah. say no. Right. Right? If right. they've got some artifact from their school days or something about yeah. town. Right. Right, they had a business or they ran a community organization or mm -hmm. participated in one. I mean, I mentioned the farmer's market records. That's fairly recent. and you know, 1972 it's an important, or something. Yeah, important part of our history. And so now we have the minutes from the early founding of that. We have, yeah. um, you know, String Orchestra of the Rockies. We have their records so you can get information about these kinds of events that are happening or, and what, what people are involved in in, in yeah. the community. So certainly we're very interested in adding materials and yeah. I'd, I'd love to talk to people if they Because there something. are so many institutions of people, you know, they have a kind of fascination of tracking. Mm -hmm. Renee Taff was here just an hour ago talking about their summer camp programs and we inevitably talked, well that was a Carnegie 
you know, library mm -hmm. that was built, and mm -hmm. that it's less recognizable now right. that they did the remodel. And I was saying, oh, that willow tree. And she said, oh, no, it's a birch. But they had this big tree in the yard, and everyone felt so bad. Yeah. And I could barely, you know, if I close my eyes, I can see that yard. But that's another strange function of time. I remember when Orange Street was two lanes, mm -hmm. and now it's four. But I can't remember. I can just barely see that Orange Street is two yeah. lanes. Or the people that see Reserve Street mm -hmm. and are amazed that that was like a two-lane right. thing through horse pasture. Right. And now there's all these box stores mm -hmm. that their grandparents would have just killed over right. if they saw right. them. And that's happened, it seems like that. Yeah. Like in the 21st century. Mm -hmm. So it's a, it's a wonderful way of battling to a degree, getting a handle on time, mm -hmm. is looking back at stuff. Or saying, if you're oh. interested in what was on your property that you own now, you know, 50 years ago, you can come look at our aerial photos of the area and right, see, and what, see what if it, it looked was like. Built and, up yeah. or not. Or yeah, if you're interested in, in how much the railroad could lie to people, or you know, different things. <laughs> yeah, or, or just see. wanted to encourage them to move. Right. Past. Yeah. What, what all that westward and homesteading yeah. was about. Yeah. I mean, some of us are here because of that. Right. So, yeah. It's it's important. Well, Donna, thank you so much for coming on the thank show. Thank you very much. And, I really um, appreciate it. Feel free to come back if you know something develops okay. or you want to make a pitch yeah. to the general public. I will do that. Well, right now I'm, I'm pitching the need for somebody to translate Japanese, but there might be. Well, and, and getting in We new have an intern, Misaho Yamada, <laughs> who's interning with MCAP for the summer. She might just take a gander at your book yeah. after we finish. I'll, I'll bring it out there. Good. Yeah. Thanks, Joel. Oh, really you're most, most welcome. Thanks for being on the show. Yeah. And thank you guys for watching this edition of What's Up Missoula. If you know of a group, you want to see them on this program, give us a call at MCAT. The number is 542-6228. For MCAT, I'm Joel Baird. Thanks for watching. Okay, we get to go. That was awesome. Yeah, good. I'm glad thank you enjoyed you. it. And you can show the book to me. Oh, that's yeah. so fun.